a lot of banks and professional funds will trade what we call mean reversion. And this is maybe a type of a uh, little bit controversial. I would not obsess over risk reward ratio. Hey, what's up guys? So today we have Kathy Lin and she is a very successful trader. You might have seen her on Wall Street Warriors and she's a former JP Morgan. Yes. Chase trader and she has a lot to share with us today. So the first question I have for Kathy is, since you have traded with the big banks, traded Forex and many other asset classes, so what are the time frames that you trade and what do you use them for? You know, that's a very good question, um, Karen. I get this question a lot, which is, you know, what is my favorite time frame? And I would have to say, you know, my trading um, signals and the trades I pick are keyed off of the one hour time frame. But just because my strategy triggers on a one hour time frame doesn't mean that I look at the one hour time frame alone. I'm a strong believer of multiple time frame analysis. So even though I may have um, the trigger on a one hour time frame, I will always always check the higher time frames, the four hour chart, the daily chart, to make sure I'm not buying into resistance or selling into support. I think those are very basic tenets that everyone needs to follow. You can't just focus on one time frame. And you know, along those lines, I think that the one hour time frame is reflective of my personality. I'm not a scalper. I'm not an aggressive day trader. I'm also, you know, I don't hold positions for weeks. Sometimes I'll hold positions for overnight, for a day, Usually that's about it, sometimes for two days, and but that's the maximum I'll hold my positions for. A lot of my followers would like to know, as a former bank trader, what is your daily routine like right now? Well, I no longer trade for a bank. Um, so basically, the schedule that I have um, is very different. I trade twice a day. I trade the New York Open and I trade the Asia Open. So at, at the New York Open, I'm usually up um, by you know 6 a.m., and I'm doing my research, I'm looking at the opportunities, I'm looking at the analysis and data that happened overnight, I'm looking at what the movements in the uh, overseas markets are. And then um, after looking at the news flow and the data, I will look at um, my trading setups and um, I'll look at whether you know I have a setup to buy a currency pair or sell a currency pair. And then usually I'll take this trade and I'll hold it into the New York market open. Now, but usually, almost always I close my trade in the New York session trade by the London close. The other um, time that I trade um, is at the Asia Open. So for me, at the Asia Open is defined differently for everyone. Some people define it as 5 p.m. New York time, some people define it as 7, 8. For me, I define it as 8 um, New York time. Usually before that, um, I'm just kind of seeing if there's any big moves in the markets or data that's coming up. But typically with the Asia session trades, I've already watched the markets throughout the New York session. So nothing new is really happening between the New York session close, which is 4 or 5 p.m. New York time, and the Asia Open. So I'm just seeing Seeing the calendars to see if there's any um, thing that's going to affect my trade on the calendar. And I love trading the Asia session. I think we talked about this before. I love to trade the Asia session because those are usually my biggest movers and those are usually my most generous trades. So for the Asia session trades, I'll lay them on at um, 8 p.m. New York time and oftentimes I will carry them over um, overnight. And you know, more often than not, when I wake up in the morning, the profit targets are hit or half my position has hit a profit target. I'm trailing my stop on the other half of the position. So those two um, are kind of my clearest time frames where I have my setups to trade. Okay, so this is what a lot of retail traders would like to know, okay? What are some of the key strategies or techniques that big banks employ in forex trading that individual retail traders can also utilize? It's kind of funny you asked me this question because I actually had, you know, a while back, um, did a whole presentation on this in Singapore. Maybe someday I'll do it again. There are many techniques that bank traders trade that um, retail traders can replicate. Obviously not in the same way, but the idea is the same. The two most popular ways that bank traders trade is number one, um, they will trade the flow. Meaning that um, oftentimes, you know, I used to make markets um, in currencies at J.P. Morgan Chase, and we would get um, incoming flow from the customers, the um, mutual funds, uh, the corp corporates who are, you know 
taking transactions and offsetting it. And oftentimes what will happen is that the bank traders, if they hear that a big company is selling, let's say 20 million euro dollar, they'll ride the flow. You know, especially if it's what we call um, smart money, where it's not necessarily corporate, but maybe a fund who may, who may actually know what they're doing. Um, they may, we will ride the flow, meaning that we will sell in conjunction with that. Now, th that is not something that retail traders can replicate. But what you can do as a retail trader is take that same type of philosophy, which is that the best trades are the ones that are on the side of momentum. You want to take the trades where the, the momentum and the sentiment of the market, the overall market, is on your side. So, for example, if um, I'm waking up at the New York Open and I've seen that your dollar has fallen significantly for whatever reason during the European session, a similar flow trade would be to sell the euro dollar assuming that it's going to be to be continuation when New York traders come onto the desk. The other way that you can replicate bank strategies is that a lot of banks and professional funds will trade what we call mean reversion. Very fancy way of saying just getting back to the average, right? So when you have a huge move, it is an assumption that you know the move won't last, it will correct, and that the overbought, oversoldness will ease and will return back to normal conditions, particularly if you're trading on a very short-term basis. So you can take that similar type of idea and um, you can look at the standard deviations. You know, I love to look at Bollinger Bands, and when price get to the third standard deviation. That means that you're three standard deviations away from average, which is very abnormal. So if it starts to reverse, and you always want to wait for it to start to reverse first, there's a good chance that that reversal could be more significant getting back to the um, usually what we call the middle line, the 20 period moving average. So that's another way that you can replicate the same type of philosophy that bank traders do. A lot of retail traders like to debate that Technical analysis is better than other forms of analysis, whereas the institutional traders that I came across, that I talked to, they all focus a lot on fundamental analysis. So which approach do you recommend to retail traders, technical or fundamental analysis and why? I think that you cannot just trade on one or the other. You absolutely have to use a combination of both if you want to be a successful trader. Because if you think about it, even if you can't really understand fundamental analysis and um, only the charts make sense to you, minimally, you have to know what's on the calendar. You have to know, you know why the market wants to buy US dollars or sell US dollars, and you know, whether the Federal Reserve is going to look to lower interest rates um, or raise interest rates. You have to minimally know the very basics that you can find you know, on the, the front page websites of CNBC.com or Bloomberg.com. At the same time, though, just because you have a theory of where something should go doesn't mean that it's just going to go that way at the exact same point in time that you decide to put on a trade. So it's very important to combine your fundamentals with your technicals um, in order to select the best trades. I like to use fundamentals to determine the direction and technicals to determine the entry and exits. Retail traders, they tend to ignore fundamentals, right? I think they try really hard. I think yeah. that um, I get a lot of questions from yeah. retail traders wanting to learn fundamentals, but it's not easy. It's if you put a little time to it and if you want to take trading serious, seriously, it's not that hard as well. Mm -hmm. And it does take a little work if you want to make money. Even though a lot of them automatically go to technical analysis, the sheer amount of interest that I have in fundamentals shows that people are trying and they're recognizing the importance of it. By the way, Katie's book is really good when it comes to learning fundamental analysis. Thank you so much. The one with the white color. That's called uh, day trading and swing trading, the currency market. It's the one I'm actually the most proud of, but it's also one of the oldest ones, I think. We should ask her to write one more book for us. So how do you approach risk management in forex trading, especially in relation to the methods used by major financial institutions? You know, through all my years of trading, the smartest way to manage risk is um, to recognize that the immediate moves that you get in the market um, may not be as generous as you may want. And sometimes the movements aren't enough to hit your ideal targets. So I think the best way to trade, especially when it comes to trading Forex, is to use a two or three tiered exit, meaning that you enter your entire position, you maybe sell 
half of your position when it's moved by the amount risk, trail your stop to break even, and then let the rest of it ride and potentially participate in the bigger move. So you wanna be able to bank the greens. You wanna be able to collect profits along the way before you actually wait for those larger moves. Because sometimes it'll happen, sometimes it won't. But you wanna be able to still bank profits along the way um, as you get towards those trades. Cathy, you've been in the trading education industry for many years now. You've been trading for banks. So what do you feel is the major difference between retail traders and institutional traders? Well, I think the major difference between retail traders and institutional traders is that um, with institutional traders, um, usually they end up holding their positions for a lot um, longer than retail traders because they need to justify the reason why they're taking their um, trades to the risk management desk, to their managers, no, you know, a whole ladder of um, higher ups. And they need to have sound reasonings for the entries and exits. Whereas retail traders are much more impulse driven. And the only one they have to answer to is themselves. And so they tend to be much more impulsive and get in and out of trades more quickly than um, institutional investors or traders. More aggressive to right? Yes, definitely. I think retail traders are far more aggressive more and more impatient because institutionals, you know, before they take every trade, they have to have a, a good reason for it and they have to have a good reason that to be able to explain every process and every part of the process to many layers of management, which that accountability, I think, you know, makes them more conservative. Do they tend to focus more on fundamentals or technical analysis? Um, usually it's uh, two things. Usually it's either um, some type of you know arbitrage opportunity, and this they're hyper they're, they're focused primarily on the arbitrage opportunities, or they're focused on global macro. I mean they're not going to be trading off of moving average crossovers. They're going to be trading on usually deviations in the markets. That reminds me of one question. A lot of retail players always ask this: is what indicators do the institutions use? Technical indicators specifically. Every institution is different. And I think that a lot of times the technical indicators that they use are only technical indicators that they use just for observation purposes. Um, it's not what they base their uh, strategies off of. So most of the time they will base their strategies off of arbitrage opportunities, how misalignment in markets, how different things are happening, or you know actual data. The technical analysis is just if they're doing nothing, they're sitting there, they'll just maybe monitor their trades using some technical analysis. But I don't think that it's ever going to be the reason why they take the trade. Maybe they may use an excuse as a reason to get out of a trade, but their justification for getting in trade needs to be much bigger and more well-developed than just indicators. Katie, you mentioned about global macro trading, which I've done a whole seminar on this recently too. It's related to fundamental analysis in a way. So a lot of retail traders want to learn fundamental analysis, global macro trading, which is what George Soros use and a lot of hedge funds use. So what do you recommend them to do to learn all this uh, sort of more technical stuff? You know, there's a lot of very smart people on uh, Twitter, you know, now X or X formerly Twitter. Um, there's a lot of very smart bank analysts on there. The name slips me. I think it's VJ Patel FX. He's very, very smart. Lots of, you know, correlation charts. My point is if you want to learn more, first of all, you have to start reading some of the major fundamental publications, but then also follow some of the, you know, more intelligent um, institutional level um, analysts that are on, on X, like Kobeski letter is also very popular you know maybe I can share with you a list um, there's that's a really good way to learn because I think that you know they are pointing you at two things that are interesting to them that they are looking at on a global macro level um, I remember you said that you guys should just follow whoever I follow on yes yeah, my that's follow a... list has now gotten much oh. longer and sometimes With includes random things irrelevant so. stuff okay, okay. <clears throat> but I think you know maybe I'll do like a filtered I have mm -hmm. to figure out what's possible or not like a filtered list mm -hmm. that I can put just um, mm -hmm. the financial influencers on there Yeah. okay so this is a great one okay what, what role does fundamental analysis play in your forest trading strategy and how does it compare to the approaches taken by institutional traders well, fundamental analysis plays a huge role in my my selection of trades because you know you have a lot of with any technical setup you have a lot of signals and you'll you'll have a lot of false signals and fundamentals help me filter out the good versus um, poor 
signals. The fundamentals are determined by, you know, what's happening in each economy, what central bankers are doing, and, you know, a lot of the big stories. Now, with um, institutionals, they'll look at um, the same type of general outlook that I'll look at, which is, you know, the direction of interest rates, what yields are doing, how, you know, the economic indicators are doing, but they will not be parlaying or they may not be parlaying that with a uh, with a technical strategy. And um, previously, we talked about how they will most likely be looking at deviations in the markets or relative value plays, and they are looking at much longer term um, positioning or shorter term arbitrage opportunities, which is different from what I do. So how do you handle the psychological aspects of trading, such as dealing with trading emotions and maintaining discipline, especially when emulating the strategies of institutional traders? Well, trading psychology is always the hardest part for um, many traders. The thing that made the most di biggest difference for me is when I established a weekly trading target for myself. By establishing a weekly trading target, it's kind of like goal setting, right? Just goal setting in life in general. Once you set a goal, you kind of focus on the goal and focus on achieving it. A lot of times with traders, um, their only goal is to make money. And they don't know how much, they don't know, you know, when it'll happen or how quickly it'll happen. They just want to make money, period. But, you know, when you have a very fixed goal in a certain period of time, like a weekly goal, then, you know, what ends up happening is the beginning of the week, I will be more aggressive towards working towards my goal. And once my goal is hit, I'll be much more conservative and, you know, in terms of protecting my profits and then adding to it gradually. You know, when I started doing that, that's been a really transformational aspect to my trading and my own psychology because I've been able to focus on not only the trading setup, but also, you know, really banking pips on a week to week basis. So Kathy, if you can start your trading career all over again, what would you do differently? Well, if I could start all over again, I would definitely follow a couple of things. Number one, I would definitely start almost immediately looking at trend following strategies. The trend is your friend and it's really, really true. While you know many people are tempted to pick tops and bottoms, you'll quickly realize that much more generous trades, much more relaxed trades um, and easier trades happen with the trend. So it's much better to look for opportunities to um, join the trend than to try to fade it. A lot of traders that come in trying to fade it, and, I, and I'll be honest, you know, I tried to do that in the beginning too. One of my favorite strategies for a long time, which I still like, is my Bollinger Band turn strategy. But, you know, following the trend and looking for um, momentum-based trades will make your life a lot easier. And then I would establish a trading target very quickly because having a target gives you a goal and gives you something to focus on. And I would also, you know, start f figuring out what is the right time frame um, for you to trade because it should really be based upon um, the type of person you are, whether you um, are someone who is more focused on looking at the markets you know, every couple of minutes, then you know maybe you should be more of a day trader. If you have a, a, a very demanding job and you can't follow the markets very closely, then you know you want to make sure that you want to focus on being a, a swing trader. And the other thing is I would not, and this is maybe a type of a uh, little bit controversial, I would not obsess over the um, risk reward ratio. Uh, yeah, I have worked with so many traders on institutional and an individual retail level. And even though um, everyone is taught two to one, three to one risk reward, I will tell you that the most successful traders are the ones that have one to one risk reward on their first level, and then they trail their stop on their second level because you know, there's a huge psychological drag if you hit loser, 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 loser before you hit that one winner. And if you focus on high accuracy trades and you lower that initial risk reward ratio, it's going to give, create a much more positive experience for you and much more positive experience for your overall PNL. And I think you know, that's he much healthier for you as well as everyone who you know may be involved because you won't be taking it home, for example. So um, I think you know those are things I would you know wished I had known right away. Focus more on higher time frames or lower time frames because a lot of retail traders they love the small time frames because it gives them a lot of trades. So what do you think about that? I have never really traded five minutes or fifteen minutes. For me, I've almost always focused on one hour and up. 
I cannot say that the lower time frames um, are ineffective because there are plenty of people who trade on the lo- lower time frames. But I think it's really about you know figuring out what works um, for you and your own personality. Because um, I realize that you know I like to watch the markets, but not that much. What are the important lessons that you have learned from your time at JP Morgan that have shaped your perspective on trading? I would have to say that my entire perspective on trading is based upon my time at JP Morgan. Because when I joined JP Morgan, although I was on the market making desk initially, when uh, they merged with Chase, I joined the cross markets prop trading desk. And what that meant is that I learned how um, other markets influence the Forex market. And I also learned how to look at other markets um, as a guide to be able to determine what's going to happen in the Forex markets. And even to this day, it um, is the way I trade. It's the way I you know, teach people to look at you know bond yields and stocks and all that stuff like that, because it came from what I learned in the very beginning. So I think you know it's been significantly influential in the way I trade these days. Intermarket analysis. Yeah. Yeah, specifically, which is super important. A lot of retail players, they don't focus enough on that. So. Right. We have a couple of questions from our subscribers on this channel. So what are the biggest challenges you have had in your trading career and what did you struggle with the most? And then how do you overcome them? The greatest challenge was really trying to figure out a trading strategy that worked consistently that I could trust. It took me a long time. You know, if you've ever um, attended my presentations or followed my careers, you may have learned a number of different strategies from me. But I've been trading my current strategy for at least eight or nine years now. And, you know, I've become very, very comfortable with it. I trust it. I understand when it works, when it doesn't work. I understand exactly when to trade it, when not to trade it. It took me a long time to figure that out. And it took me a long time to understand, I think it's it's very, very important for you to understand that knowing when not to trade is just as important as knowing when to trade. And um, that's a part of understanding your strategy. And it took a lot of time for me to truly figure out why certain sessions were so good for me and certain such periods of time was not. When I overcame that, I think that built a lot of confidence because I think a lot of traders, a lot lot of the problem they have is that if they hit a a losing streak, they um, start to worry. And they wonder, you know, how can they get the confidence to get back in and keep trading? And I think that confidence is built in truly understanding your strategy inside and out and understanding how it performs on a long term basis so that even if you have a losing week, you can step back and see the longer term performance and realize that this this happens. There will always be a losing day, a losing week, a losing session, a losing month. But as long as it's still, you know, within what it should be doing and that it's happening for a reason, you can keep trading and trusting your um, strategy. You've done it for a very long time. What are the major fundamental drivers, economic indicators that you pay attention to the most? The number one most important economic data or numbers that you should pay attention to are the ISM and PMI numbers. Now, they are, may not be the most market moving, but the reason why they're so important is first off, they are usually the first pieces of economic data to be released for that particular month. So if it's March, you know, they'll be coming out the March numbers, those numbers will come out first. And they can be used as leading indicators for many other numbers like non-farm payrolls, employment reports, retail sales reports, inflation reports. So even though not many people follow them, I think that they are um, the most important um, economic indicators to follow, even though they may not also be the most market moving. So a lot of the institutional traders, hedge funds, they like they, they often use Bloomberg Terminal. And personally for you, which trading platform do you normally use? So I also um, had a Bloomberg Terminal for a very, very long time, but then I realized I really don't need it anymore because a lot of the information flow is just as quick on um, a lot of the um, relatively inexpensive platforms like um, New Squawk or Financial Juice. And it's also very, very quick on X as well. I think that, you know, with technology, with time, everything has become a much more level playing field. And you can get a lot of the information that I would normally pay, you know, thousands of dollars a month for completely free. And I think minimally, you should be watching Financial Juice the new squawk um, because I think you know they're very fast they're very good with you know giving you the information that you need to know quickly so what do you normally do on those days when there are no trades if you follow Katie on Twitter you 
probably know she goes on vacation so what do you on those days when there's no treats yes I do go on vacation a lot um, the thing is that what's the definition of no trades right I trade pretty much every single day um, the Asia session um, and the New York session with the exception of um, a head of major event risk like the FOMC rate decision or non-farm payrolls and the inflation reports I won't trade those days but the rest of the time when there's no data, that could still provide plenty of opportunity because sometimes when you do have um, event, it's actually more complicated because um, you have a lot of hesitation in the markets before you actually get some clear direction. So you might actually have some, a lot of false signals. So sometimes when there's nothing going on, those are the best opportunities because you have the market really digesting what happened before um, in order to, to really you know decide where it wants to go. So I, like I said, understand my setup inside now and there, are, I don't trade specific um, events. I don't trade specific times of the day. It usually works pretty well. But I'll have to, you know, say that if my trade is showing that it's not working out and the market's very consolidative um, and there truly is nothing going on, even though I may have a trade on, I won't hesitate to close it early either. So, Katie, you've been teaching for many years now. What are the most common mistakes that retail traders make? There are so many common mistakes. Um, I can't even isolate. Yeah, there's so many different mistakes. I think a lot of retail traders, um, they won't truly understand what and when, when they're trading. So what they'll do is they'll just learn a setup from somebody and they'll just think that it's going to work you know, all the time. Or they'll buy EA from someone thinking that it's going to work all the time. They don't take the time to really understand the trading strategy and understand that nothing can work 100% of the time. And another mistake is that, that I often see is um, revenge trading. You know, they have a losing trade, they get back in and they try to double their size in order to win it all back. And you know, that can also be very, very problematic. And another mistake that I see is that they tend to be too greedy with their profits. So if you imagine you're, you're a day trader, right? You say that, okay, I want to have a um, 20 or 30, probably a 30 point stop on my trade. And I've been taught to achieve a two to one risk reward minimum. So they're trying to go for 60 pips in you know the three or four hours they're sitting there for, to trade it and you know, they might not get there and so and too often I would have to say the most common mistake is that they let the trade move in their favor by a good amount and then they just watch it completely reverse and then move into losses and I think not understanding how to protect your profits and have a defensive mindset is also one of those very common mistakes that traders make. What's your opinion about market manipulation? I think the Forex market is huge. I think that market manipulation um, is very uh, hard given how much um, movement and flow and participation that is happening um, in, in the market itself. Now, you know, sometimes, you know, you may have some brokers doing things here or there, but in general though, the market is very, very big and it's hard to manipulate, you know, the, the entire market, particularly in liquid currency like euro dollar or dollar yen. Just now I think I asked it if I'm just gonna ask it. Kathy, when are you writing your next book for us? I actually have a book coming out in November. Oh, oh. Yes. What's it about? Though? It's called um, Prop Trading Secrets, um, How Successful Traders Are Living Off the Markets. And in this book, I interview 12 or 13 successful prop traders. Now, this is prop traders in the um, entire definition of prop trading. There's a modern way of prop trading that you know a lot of traders are getting into. But the traders that I've interviewed in this book um, are, you know, some of them have traded for decades. Some of them are trading champions of trading competitions. Some of them um, are proprietary traders who've turned into money managers. And of course, some of them trade the modern way of prop trading. And in this book, you know, I talk about their stories, the commonalities in what they do. I reveal, you know, little slivers of their trading strategy that they'll share with me. I give takeaways on, you know, some of the things I learned um, from them. And so I think, you know, um, it's going to be a very fun book. And I'm hoping I'll come out in November because that's when, you know, the deadline's July, um, which is very, very soon. And if I meet my deadline, it should come out in November. <laughs> you know, I find this very, this is very interesting because you'll learn a lot about other people's trading strategies too. And there's some traders that are fundamental traders too that I think is very neat. You have 
actually got a book that's called Millionaire Traders. Yes. And that is a good book too. Maybe you can check it out too. You guys can check it out too. So what's next for you? Like, what's coming up for you? Aside from the speaking engagements, the books. How's life like as a full-time trader, enjoying life? Well, I mean, life is, I'm not just a full-time trader. I'm, you know, also a mom to two young boys. Um, so life is very, very full. I'm very excited about um, kind of um, returning to Asia. And this is my first time sitting here with Karen. This is my first time in Singapore since the pandemic. And I plan to come out here more often. I'm consulting, you know, with... Um, companies on helping to expand their business throughout parts of Asia. There's a lot coming. I'm definitely much more interested in sharing the prop trading opportunity with um, this part of the world in Asia. I think that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity and interest that's going to be built out here by some of the local companies um, and international companies. And someone who's been in the industry for a very long time told me that there hasn't been as much um, demand for a specific trading product since the beginning of retail FX and that's you know prop trading and it's exploding in the US and it, that's why I'm so excited to, to share that in this part of the world as well. If you guys want to follow Katie you can follow her YouTube channel, social media. So what are your social medias? Kathy? Certainly. I mean, you can follow me um, at KathyLeanFX on X. I am tweeting all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also follow me on YouTube um, at YouTube forward slash BK4X. You know, if you want, you know, you can follow me on Instagram. I am the only one with the verified check mark in my face. There are a lot of scammers. Please don't fall for it. My handle is Forex Macro Queen. And of course, our website, bktraders.com. Yeah, beware of the fake accounts. There are a lot of yes. Especially over the platforms I didn't tell you about, like Telegram and mm -hmm. WeChat yeah. and WhatsApp. Yeah. I am definitely not on those platforms and not going to be um, asking you to send me money on any of those platforms, and any platform, period. But yeah. just I'm just not on Telegram and WhatsApp and WeChat um, and all those other places. Very often the scams are on Telegram and WhatsApp. Yeah. And, and I will never message you on Discord either. Never. Basically, I will never direct message you as much as I love you. So. Um, um, you can always check with me too, Kathy at bktraders.com and say, is this person legit? And I'll tell you, chances are that they are not and they're just trying to scam you. Okay, great. We are done.